Welcome everyone. We'll get started in a minute. Uh, just waiting to, to get everything going. So give us some time. A lot of people log in. I do like the Monday morning live banner behind you, Matt. I know I it's, the old, it's, it's the old one. Wait, I guess I got lean like this. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the office today in Ann Arbor. So. Uh, Get the old branding there. So we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like uh, Facebook is live. Um, welcome to another edition of Live with the League, a kind of a special uh, edition today, uh, if you will. Uh, we had one uh, session last week, and then we're having one today. And then our next one's not going to be now until March 7th. We're going to skip it on the President's Day, where a lot of our municipalities are closed which is next Monday, which would be our normal one that we're doing. So we're skipping next Monday's doing today because we had a lot to talk about. We had a lot of uh, budget announcement last week. And so a lot of different things coming on, a lot of things that impact our members. We also will have a guest joining us to talk a little bit about Capital Conference. He's gonna be one of our speakers and we're gonna have him come in, but he's got another call. So he'll be joining us late. Um, so we'll get started with the Lansing team. Um, so, uh, Chris and John, Jen, Harrisana, thank you for joining us. Talk to a little bit, uh, start off with Chris and John, about the budget uh, proposal last week announced by the governor, um, some of the highlights that you see in there for communities. Thanks, Matt. Obviously, the, the big thing um, that we saw come out of this budget, you remember we talked a few weeks ago, the governor did her state of the state message, kind of teased a little bit of, of some of the programmatic things uh, she was interested in. Uh, we got details on, on how the governor is going to fund those uh, in this budget. It's a $74 billion budget total, um, over $14 billion in general fund. That's just an amazing amount considering we went through a period of years where we bounced between $9 billion and $11 billion GF for close to a decade. Uh, GF funding was pretty stagnant. Uh, and here we jump up to $14 billion in general fund spending. Now, again, some of that's going to be one time, but there certainly is still uh, at least some short-term op optimism that, uh, that that funding is going to continue. Now, the downside is uh, everybody's looking at the fact that there's uh, increases in ongoing revenue and it's an, and it's an election year. So uh, everybody's coming out of the woodwork looking for a tax cut, which is something that we obviously have to be concerned about from the longer term perspective and how that impacts general fund uh, access for members for things like revenue sharing. So and of course, Chris, we're, we're not opposed to the tax cuts. We just don't want the revenue for streams for those to be, you know, rest on the shoulders of our communities. Well, and that's, that's exactly it. it it's, it's looking at you know, any tax cut in a very responsible manner. I mean, we know all local governments have gone through the Great Recession. We've seen what's happened to the state budget, you know, following that period and how long it took even the state's budget to recover, uh, you know, not even counting the fact that local government budgets haven't recovered. So, you know, anything that the legislature and the governor looks at needs to be done very responsibly, very carefully, and with a long-term view to ensure that we don't hit a period in three years where we're back to cutting revenue sharing 30% like happened in 2011. Okay. So talk about some of the highlights, some of the things you saw that our members are probably going to like. Well, you know, so talking about revenue sharing, it's a, it's a big bump there. Uh, in my, in my history with revenue sharing, I don't know that we've done a 10% boost, $26 million in one, in one fell swoop. So that's great news. 5% uh, of that funding would go into the, the base amount and 5% would be categorized as one time. Um, but, you know, the net effect is a 10% increase, $26 million increase in statutory revenue sharing. That's a, that's a big deal. And, and we're absolutely very pleased with that. We're continuing to push for, you know, it still doesn't get us back to where we were in 2011. So we are continuing to push that as a, as a, the next step that needs to be taken, but that gets us more than halfway back, uh, to the remainder of, of that shortfall. So that's something that we view as, as very positive. Um, you know, looking at another item that has been a huge priority for, for the league as we looked at this budget was the governor did uh, agree with, with our request 
And she recommended $50 million go towards those communities that are likely to see a negative constitutional revenue sharing adjustment because of declining population. That's, that adjustment is not scheduled to take place until April, till the April revenue sharing payment. We aren't gonna get actual estimates of impact on declining population communities until the end of this month, first part of March. But uh, you know everything we're hearing and, and seeing from some of the numbers is that's gonna be that $50 million should be able to hold, hold all those declining communities harmless from any clawback. They'll still experience an adjustment downward because of the population. But um, you know that is is something that I think is is a big deal for our for our folks, and we're very very happy for that. Um, you know, in looking at uh, some of the other major items, and I'll let I'll let the rest of the team kind of get into these. Uh, but you know, one of the other things I think from a revenue sharing style standpoint that uh, that I'll be tracking closely, uh, the governor put a forty million dollar recommendation in the budget for communities in transition. So communities dealing with workforce changes, um, you know, where they're seeing a lot more remote work or a major impact on downtown employers and, and uh, workers in their downtowns, there'd be funding available uh, in grants potentially for that. Um, John, why don't you walk through, I know there's a lot of environmental, John and Harrisana, there's a lot of environmental uh, and infrastructure money. I'll let you guys kind of walk through some of that. Yeah, you know, and, and I'll piggyback on some of the things that you said too, Chris. I mean, you know, budget's interesting this year because it's so big uh, in terms of it, its actual amount of revenue within it. And there are some uniquenesses uh, incorporated into it as a result of, of funding from multiple sources. So not just state funds uh, from, the, from the general fund, not just our typical federal funds, but also the American Rescue Plan continues to play into that. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or the IIJA continues to play into that. And so I'll, I'll focus a little bit on some of the infrastructure pieces and then Harrisana, I'll turn it over to you on, on some of the other environmental aspects that are included in this bill. But infrastructure has a mix. I mean, as you would typically suspect within the, the, the state budget, Act 51, and so our appropriation from transportation revenues derived from gas taxes and registration fees are incorporated within this. But there's also uh, a, a, about $578 million from the Infrastructure uh, Investment and Jobs Act that is in, in this as well, uh, about $100 million of that, which will go directly into uh, local units of government. Uh, in addition to that, there's, there's a, another $111 million out there uh, in state restricted funds for roads and bridges. And, and our understanding, at least on the front end of this, has a lot to do with what's going to be uh, involved in bridge replacement across this state. And then if we circle way back uh, to when we all uh, enjoyed the governor's announcement on a 45 cent gas tax increase uh, in her proposal a few years ago, uh, there was a component of that though that talked about sending a portion of that money to economically significant roads, uh, which in a lot of cases can be M roads through our downtowns across the state. Uh, and so there is a, a component of this budget that sends $150 million to economically significant uh, roads across the state. For those that um, live in Southeast Michigan and have experienced some of the flooding in, in recent memory, uh, particularly as it's related to failing pump stations along our highways and, and some of the, the problems that that's caused, the governor's proposed putting $66 million into replacing pump stations across the state uh, to upgrade that infrastructure. And again, while that's very specific maybe to uh, things actually owned by the state or, or the Department of Transportation, when we look at the secondary impacts of that, that can lead to flooding in neighborhoods and those types of things, uh, a very positive inclusion within this. Um, and then just a couple of, of smaller pieces in here uh, as it relates to, to infrastructure, particularly around um, our railroads. Uh, we've talked about rail grade separation. So this idea of actually separating uh, the, the rail system from the at grade road as a way to deal with some congestion issues that have, have cropped up, particularly in Southeast Michigan again, but it has prevented you know some of the simplest things from happening like kids getting to school on time and delaying buses but to the much more significant aspect, which is delayed ambulance and, and fire runs, uh, which can be extremely problematic when timing is of great concern in those areas. 
And then finally is, is coordination of all of this stuff. And I, and I don't want to minimize this. Um, you know, the, the White House, uh, after the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, had made a suggestion to all 50 states that they set up an, an office of infrastructure. Uh, the governor did that a few months back here in the state and is proposing $5 million uh, to really um, coordinate all the efforts from everything from what the state does to where the American Rescue Plan uh, impacts this, and then primarily where the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, intersects with this. That becomes important to us because there is a lot of grant opportunities out there uh, available to local units of government. And the specific task of that office is to coordinate between the federal level, the state level, and the local level in a way that ha hasn't happened before. So funding for that particular mechanism within state government is going to be important. Um, and so, Matt, I, I see your comments, so I'll kick it back to you real quick. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, team. Uh, uh, we did want to uh, kind of stop midstream of our budget presentation and shift over to our guest that has joined us. Um, it's Kieran O'Connor of Br the Braver Angels, and he is going to be one of our general session speakers at our upcoming capital conference, which we also call CapCon in, in March. It's March 15th and 16th. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you having this on the show, or you being on our show, I should say. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Matt. And, and to all of you, thank you for, for having me. I'm really excited to speak to the league at CapCon in mid-March. Uh, as Matt mentioned, I work for an organization called Braver Angels. Uh, we are the nation's largest grassroots nonprofit that tries to bring liberals and conservatives together. Uh, we do that in a number of ways. We started very much at the grassroots level through workshops, debates, discussions, helping people better understand one another beyond stereotypes, uh, clarify their disagreements, and start to build a little bit of trust that helps people work together at the local level. Um, we've now grown to about 11,000 members nationwide, 80 wow. local alliances. Um, I know we have a couple alliances active in Michigan. Uh, our alliances are half red, half blue. So it's a group of Republicans and Democrats in a community who come together regularly to plan workshops, discuss issues, and work together where they can. Um, this year, we're really focused on engaging politicians with our Braver Politics initiatives and taking what's worked for us at the grassroots level in terms of giving people the tools and skills needed to build uh, productive relationships across the aisle uh, and helping local politicians do that. And so we're going to be equipping our members with various programs they can take to their school board, city council, state legislatures, uh, people running for office so that they can hold uh, discussions with constituents. We are open to moderating uh, debates with candidates. Uh, so debates that differ a little bit in their format. So it's less about uh, you know, talking points and, and humiliating your opponent and more about actually engaging the issues that uh, local people wanna hear about. So. I won't go on too too much about yeah, what we want, spoil, but, spoil all the good stuff. But uh, tell us yeah. what, what are some takeaways that our members, you know, that maybe are on the fence about signing up for CapCon. What are some what are some things you think they'll come away from if they come and hear your presentation? Sure. Well, I think everyone is concerned about political division, uh, regardless of where you stand on the ideological spectrum. And so I think people should come to this session if they want to learn. Uh, some practical tools and skills uh, for having difficult political conversations, whether you're talking to someone in your family, at your workplace, or a uh, fellow public servant. All right. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that everybody needs that. So that would be a, a really good. Uh, I know a lot of our communities, you know, as the Michigan Municipal League, we're, we're a nonpartisan organization. We have members of both sides of the aisle. So it's important that we have someone like you come out and, and you know, kind of tell, tell them how to kind of communicate on both sides and, and come to common understandings and agreements, which I think is we very well uh, received. Anything else you want to add about your, your session or, or, or reasons people should attend? I mean, I think at the end of the day, the local level is where 
uh, liberals and conservatives still come together to get stuff done, right? I mean, the, the local pothole doesn't care what you think about President Trump. <laughs> it still needs to get filled. And increasingly, national politics are preventing local people from getting stuff done. So I think it's, it's needed now more than ever. And so I'm just thrilled to be, to be part of the conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, we did get a question already, uh, and uh, I have to look at the agenda, but it says, on what day is this session? I believe you are speaking at the opening general on that Wednesday, I believe it is. Yeah, March 15th, I believe. Okay, so it's Tuesday. That's a Tuesday, I think. The Tuesday is the 15th and Wednesday is the 16th. So are you doing a breakout as well? I don't think so. All right. So you can hear him on the main stage. So uh, that's the best way to, to go about that. Um, it's good, good, very good. Uh, we've got another question coming in here. Um, I'll have to look at that one. So I, we appreciate you joining us. I know you're in the middle of calls, so I appreciate you jumping on and talking to us. I hope people uh, are inspired by this and sign up for Capcom. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. All right. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye. Yep. All right, so uh, hop back to the uh, budget talk. Um, you know, I, it's interesting. You know, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing his 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 presentation because we we do run into that because we you know we do um, you know we are a nonpartisan organization, so you guys all the time are dealing with people with both sides of the aisle. So I'm sure you can also glean a few tips on how to, how to communicate with uh, both both sides would be helpful to you. So we we're talking with uh, John, and then we we're going to turn it over to Harrisana and Jen to talk about some of the uh, the budget focuses that they're looking at, and, and some of the, the the promising things that you see there. Yeah, I, I'll just I'll wrap up one thing, and and then I'll say this though, as considering yesterday was Super Bowl Sunday, I felt like that was our own like commercial break within our presentation, which was nice. So. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if he paid $7 million for that spot or not, but you know, I got it in. So um, the, I, I want to mention broadband quick because uh, the governor did propose some additional money for, for broadband in here, which we know is a huge issue for our members and many across the state. Uh, it's a portion of, of American Rescue Plan funds. There's a direct pot of $250 million that's part of the capital project fund included in that. And then I'll, I'll turn it back over to Harrison and then I know we got to talk about some other issues along the way. Well, yeah, don't mind me and my subtle contact malfunction that just happened, but good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, so on the environmental side of the budget, one thing that we are super, super excited about is an additional recommendation for $34 million for high water infrastructure grants. So if you remember last year in a supplemental, we were able to secure $14.3 million to go forward towards initial grants to support communities that have been impacted by high waters and coastal erosion, the subsequent infrastructure problems with that. Um, we also know that the area of need largely exceeds that amount of $14.3 million. And that was something that we also reiterated in the coalition's proposal. Um, but so we're really happy to see the governor recognize that. And that's something that we're hopefully try we're gonna carry the momentum forward to hopefully reinforce and add to that pot of money uh, to really ensure that all of our coastal communities that have been impacted, not just the ones on the west side and also not just ones that may sit on, on the coast. You know, high waters and coastal erosion has compounding effects. We heard John earlier talk about the impacts of flooding in southeast Michigan. And really that is a result of months and months in, of high water levels. And so better ways that we're able to be resilient in that. And so as we're considering rebuilding things, not just fixing what has been broken, but building better in the future so that we can be better accommodate changing events in our climate will be good and having the funds to do so will be even better. Um, another investment that we saw was 23 million towards energy efficiency grants. So these can be used by both local governments as well as small businesses to make energy efficiency upgrades within their construction projects. So really important, especially as we're looking at clean energy opportunities in the future and building our structures, our businesses, our homes, our communities in a way that can be resilient to that as well. And also work in line with the other infrastructure upgrades that we're seeing coming in the future. Um, I wanna pivot over to public safety because that's where we saw some huge, huge investments. Um, this is very much recommendations that were aligned with us coming out of a pandemic. You know, we had police, fire, and as well as many other essential workers throughout our communities who are still continuing to work to make sure that our communities are running safely and efficiently and are continuing all the responsibilities. So we saw 500 million in hero pay put forward. In addition, another 50 million for first responders retention payments that will go out to local communities. There were also some dollars that were separately put aside under the Department of State Police for 
Michigan State Police, but these dollars will be going to local communities as well. Um, and one thing on the public safety piece too that I wanted to talk about, not directly aligned with communities, but we saw some nice investments into cybersecurity through DTMB and Michigan State Police. And while these are investments for the state, I wanna preface this by, it's really, really important that from the top down and the bottom up, that we are resilient in our cyber health and that we have systems that are available not only to help prevent response, prevent incidents, but also respond and investigate. And that is largely the role of the Department of State Police as well as DTMB to help us in that. And so their ability to put forward 1 million for detection and investigation, and then another 3.1 million on the infrastructure of systems will be really helpful, especially as how they stand in and help support communities in the event of a cyber attack or proactively helping them establish their systems, having a state with strong best practices is something that's definitely gonna help us in the future. Awesome, thank you. Go ahead, Jen. All right, I'm gonna be the budget Grinch because everybody else has been so rosy and cheery about the budget. <laughs> uh, you know, first and foremost, like Chris may have touched upon this, but I mean, this just is the first step. It's the budget. Both chambers are still now gonna do their own proposals and the negotiating is gonna begin. So um, we'll see things changing. But, you know, one thing before I talk about what was in the budget, uh, to me, one thing that was missing was housing. Um, you know, housing was mentioned within the budget docs, uh, mostly around um, public safety, um, when it comes to money for state police and inmates and parolees, um, there was a little money in um, the Department of Ag and Rural Development um, that mentioned some affordable housing, but that was wrapped in uh, with uh, the money was also available for broadband infrastructure and a few other things. So it wasn't just housing money. Uh, we didn't see any money being um, allocated to the uh, Housing and Community Development Fund at MISHTA. Last year's budget, we saw 100 million. The governor had proposed 100 million. So we're gonna be working to um, try and get some money into that, uh, that fund here going forward, even though the governor didn't allocate any towards it. Uh, there were there was 200 million um, in, let's see, they called it Michigan Regional Empowerment Program. Uh, this was out of the governor's My New Economy Plan. Uh, these are fancy planning grants that are looking for a regional um, approach to whether it's affordable housing, um, again, broadband, manufacturing, education, workforce development. They're looking for re regional planning grants. Um, and this was something, like I said, carried over from the My New Economy Plan. 200 million, if you're even thinking regionally across the state, um, that's a great start, but we're going to see need to see some more money put in there to actually get these plans done and then try to fund some actual projects out of those plans. Um, unless folks are uh, have some great regional plans already, then maybe there'll be some project implementation money out of that. There also was $11 million um, into a fund for attainable home ownership and apprentice program that's going to the state land bank authority um, to help train folks in the trades as well as work on uh, rehabilitation and home ownership for some money. So there was a little there in housing, um, but definitely not anything like what we need going forward. All right. I uh, did get a couple of questions for the budget that came in. Um, one uh, for you, Harisana, which was uh, from Facebook. Who is the state contact for the 14 million and current fiscal year high water grants? To how do they go about that part? Yeah, so Eagle is the agency that is administering this grant. Um, they have a team of folks who are working internally to administratively build out those grants. Um, I'm happy to answer any direct questions or process questions about that offline, um, but they are the agency that's involved in that. We would anticipate that it would be Eagle again. Um, and as it's been out, recommended in the budget, we'll be administrating the high water infrastructure grants going further. Okay. And then we have uh, kind of Jen touched on it, understanding the importance of all these budget proposals. When will the budget be approved? So if you could walk a little bit more in detail, maybe Chris or, or Jen, whoever about the, um, the timeline of it. <laughs> Oh, it's possible. Jen's, it'll be Jen's no shaking her eight ball, so yeah. we'll know what that means. <laughs> Look, not the, so good, it says. Yeah. The, the one guarantee we can make, Chris, right, is it'll be done by September 30th at 11.59 p.m., because that's what the Constitution requires. Um, you know, any prediction before that becomes a little touchy. I, I think, and, and Chris, you know, weigh in on this too, I think what we're going to see is this is actually going to happen in pieces this year more than it's ever happened before. 
because there are multiple fund sources within the budget, as, as I had mentioned. So the American Rescue Plan, you know, the federal infrastructure dollars, um, and then you know your general budget uh, components of this that, that take place every every year. So I think what we'll see is probably a fair number of budget supplementals coming up in the short term. Uh, I know there's always a desire by the legislature, at least you know, recent trend uh, is to get the budget done prior to them breaking for summer, which I think, again, they will work towards that if possible. Uh, and if anything else, they will likely try to at least accomplish school aid uh, and possibly general government, which is where revenue sharing lies because of the budget cycles of local government and schools uh, and having that predictability going into them uh, prior to the state's fiscal year beginning in, in October. I think you know Jen's comment too is is really important for folks to remember. This is the governor's executive budget recommendation. The governor is required to produce this uh, every year, and this is the starting point for budget discussions. This is the governor's vision. The House is going to have their own vision. The Senate will have their own vision, and they will be completely different. There will be some things that they will you know that they will align with, and there were some comments we heard from leadership, uh, Republican leadership, following the release. Uh, to, to that effect. But you know, keep in mind, you know, some of these will be non-starters for the Republicans. Some of these uh, will be you know, significantly different or dollar amounts will be different. There will be new priorities that will be offered. So you know, this is a good marker. This is a good start. And this gives, it gives us as an organization things to point to as we go to work with the legislature on some of these important issues uh, like, like revenue sharing and the census funds and infrastructure dollars and road funding and high waters. So those are those are important markers for us. And obviously the governor now has stated a desire to have those things as priority funding. So, you know, so now we can go to work on those, but things will be different and there will be a number of different changes. Process wise, as John mentioned, you know, nothing's guaranteed uh, that, you know, they're supposed to be done by September 30th. We have seen them miss that a couple of times in the past, hopefully with a, a budget full of uh, full of funding, they they won't have to fall uh, fall late, and it is an election year, so they're not going to want to have a budget fight hanging over their heads as they go into a campaign season. So, uh, normal process here, we'll see the legislature uh, really this week starting to turn their attention to what did the governor put out, what you know, what are their priorities. And between now and the spring recess, that Easter recess period, is when you'll see a lot of the initial activity taking place within the legislature. Following that, the next big marker in the budget process is the May Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference. So around mid-May, the Senate Fiscal Agency, House Fiscal Agency, and uh, State Budget Office will work with the Department of Treasury, and those economists from those agencies will come together and come to an agreement on what they see the actual revenue stream for the coming fiscal year looking like, and they will use that estimate to finalize the budget negotiations that will take place in the latter half of May and June, again, with an eye towards finishing by the 4th of July. So that's kind of the, the rough timeline we operate under right now. Um, you know, one thing uh, I'll add to this, and then I think, John, this would be, be good for, for you to jump into. A lot of this aligned with what our coalition efforts have been talking about, uh, but there are some things that didn't align with the coalition. Uh, and or some things that needed some changes. So I know Harasana, you've got a, a, a kind of a tracker that has been put together. Why don't you guys talk a little bit about kind of how this aligns with some of our discussions with the legislature on the bigger picture of, of funding? Yeah, uh, ha happy to do that. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and, and I want to mention too, this kind of like where the fun part of advocacy begins. Um, because I mean, Chris had mentioned earlier that the, the $26 million for revenue sharing, which on paper is a great uh, sort of sign from the governor's office that she's willing to make some investments there. Truth is we're asking for 45 million, period, right? Like that's what we're, that's what we're asking for. Uh, and that's not to sound selfish, uh, but that's just trying to restore some of that, that revenue that we've lost over the course of time. So from an engagement strategy, we'll be aggressive on that. But I think it's also a very direct opportunity for our members to understand where the league's specific ask are. And you'll get this as part of capital conference. So if you're going out and you're seeing legislators, you're talking to them, you're, you're speaking to maybe potential contacts you have within the administration, then you can tell them, you know, yes, thank you. We appreciate what you're doing here very much and, and putting an emphasis on it. But here's why we need to get to 45 and you have the resources in which to do it. And as Chris had mentioned, a lot of what we're talking about here today that's incorporated in the budget 
has been included in the Coalition for a Strong and Prosperous Michigan's overall proposal, which not only derives support from you know, us at the league and our typical local government partners like MTA and, and MAC, but has about 55 other individuals and organizations that are supporting that general direction as well, which, which tends to be really powerful. What I will mention is our investment tracker, but I will take no credit for it because Harasana deserves uh, the credit for, for working through and helping us um, really identify you know, specific pieces of legislation, specific budget line items, <clears throat> and match those up with the, the coalition's proposal. So Harrison, I'll turn it over to you to talk about that. Yeah, and so for folks tuning in, I just dropped a link to the tracker directly in the chat. But yeah, as John said, you know, it is a comprehensive amount of money that we're dealing with now from all different eight angles. And the budget makes it, you know, even more so. But what we've done is put together a tracker that shows three different scenarios. One, the proposal of our roadmap, very visually, to show how much we've invested in each area and especially how that aligns with the full allocation that was received by the state, $6.5 billion. Um, so that first chart shows what we have proposed as a coalition and what's necessary and important to invest in. The second one, as John mentioned, shows where we are currently. You know, part of the message, of, the main message of our coalition has been to ensure urgency and quick intentional investment of these dollars. And so what this chart shows is enacted, proposed, and allocated funds by the legislature, and really showing in a road mark, excuse me, a road mark, where we are, where we've been, and especially how much is still on the table and what we need to do in order to invest it appropriately. And then if you go to the next one, it shows you by issue area. And so this is one we're really proud of. It shows today where investments have been based on what has been introduced by the legislature, what has been enacted, and then also how that aligns with the recommendations that our roadmap has put forward. And so this is great because as John mentioned, like we want to make sure that these investments are diversified, that they're holistic, and that what we're not doing is putting a ton of money in one direction and leaving very critical issue areas on the back burner so that there's literally no funds for them left at the end of the day. We want legislators to be conscious and aware of the funding decisions that they're making and also encouraging them to utilize the bandwidth of the coalition, our knowledge, our expertise, our support, to really push these things forward in a collaborative manner and so that we have diversified, meaningful investment across what we're trying to do and we can really make bold and transformational change for Michigan. Yeah, that's great. It's, uh, she, she put the link of those charts in there, so feel free to click on that. You can see others. There's three tabs that shows you the three charts that she talked about. So that's something that our coalition's been working on. It's really great work. I uh, do have a couple questions came in. Um, one was, uh, I think from early on in the conversation, probably John or Chris, how will the community be required to report their decline? Is it the census only? Is the question for that. So with regard to revenue sharing and so where to remember everyone, there are two parts of revenue sharing. So when you get your payments every two months, you're getting a statutory payment, which is what we've been talking about with the $26 million increase proposal. And then there's the constitutional piece. And that is, you know, the set percentage of sales tax revenue that is constitutionally dedicated to revenue sharing for cities, villages, and townships on a per capita basis. And the way the statute lays out is you are eligible for your population uh, per capita amount based on your population as of October of the year the census happens. So as of October of 2020, every city, village, and township in Michigan is eligible for their 2020 numbers to be reflected in their per capita distribution. That happens automatically. U.S. Census delivers the numbers to the state. Uh, DTMB, the Department of Technology Management and Budget, gives that information to the state demographer. The state demographer goes through and makes adjustments to that. Villages, sometimes communities that are in multiple jurisdictions, institutional populations, all those adjustments are made. And then that information gets sent over to Michigan Department of Treasury, and they input that into their calculation for distribution. This year, because, because the delay last year in census delivery, and then some issues at the state level, you know, Michigan Department of Treasury just got those adjusted numbers in January. So as Michigan Department of Treasury is now working to get them into their system, the distribution formula, they're not going to be completed with that until sometime the end of this month, early March. So no community has to do anything. Um, those census numbers are the official numbers that, that have come through. And, um, you know, if there are obviously other issues a lot of our communities have with regard to the census numbers that took place, uh, whether you're a community with a, a, a university that may have had students go home 
or numbers that just don't look right, there is a set process through US Census for appeal. But we also recognize that that the census in 2020 was a completely unique animal. Um, and the processes that were in place um, prior to this may not actually work. And so uh, we're having conversations internally, we're talking with some legislators, but there's probably a larger federal conversation that can take place as well. But certainly in the short term, those numbers that came out are the official numbers and Treasury will be working with those numbers to get them inputted into the revenue sharing formula uh, in the next six weeks here. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, you, you mentioned a little bit about some of the, I don't know if tax cut fever is the right word, but a lot of people are talking about tax cuts with the surpluses and things. Um, can you kind of, the question uh, from uh, out of the Q&A is, uh, basically, I think they're asking to sort out what, what's real and what is just a proposal at this point. He said, I understand there's a no tax on pensions. I also understand there's another uh, uh, one regarding feminine hygiene products and adult baby diapers. I think some of those have become law and some of those are not. Can you kind of sort them out for us? Sure. And, and uh, just to add a few, you've got uh, rebates on vehicles and uh, contact lenses and pet food and you know and it could keep going so uh you know welcome to my to my life on a daily basis uh tracking tax policy but you know certainly is matt the, the feminine hygiene product uh sales tax uh, reduction that went into effect uh that was signed there are a host of other things that are still being considered the legislature's talking about them um they're moving back and forth between the chambers uh, there's again this week we have pet food and contact lenses up in committees this week, uh, and you know so trying to figure out what are the impacts of those. The the vehicle rebates uh, being sales use tax exempt is uh, in the Senate and had a hearing this last week. So there's a lot going on on the sales tax front. Keep in mind the state has, as I mentioned, 14 billion dollars in general fund in this budget, and they still have general fund dollars available to spend. So they have a fund balance that they came out of last year with uh, on top of the rainy day fund. There's literally billions of dollars in either one-time or ongoing general fund that doesn't touch American Rescue Plan. So there, there isn't really a, a fear at this point of you know, a, any of the, the American Rescue Plan prohibitions impacting those proposals. But there are, as we look at all these various proposals, these you know, death by a thousand cuts, if you will, how do each of these whether it's sales tax cuts or personal property tax changes or uh, property tax changes or income tax changes, how will they either directly or indirectly uh, impact local government revenues or dollars the state has available to fund local governments? And th so those are the things that we track on a daily basis. And I encourage everyone, if you haven't signed up for our Inside 208 legislative blog, please sign up for that. That'll give you, you know, up to date every time we post something uh, on happenings at the legislature, you'll be updated right away. So I encourage everyone to sign up for that. Is there one tax cut in particular, and there might not be, that you're really worried about as far as the biggest impact on our members, the one that uh, you're keeping the closest eye on? Oh, so I, I mean, I think, yes, there are multiple, if you will. <laughs> so, you know, the governor proposed the earned income tax credit expansion, uh, and the elimination of, of the what we'll call the pension tax. There are some large dollar amount impacts in those. So we're gonna be watching those real closely in terms of the long-term impact on the state's revenue stream. Um, the Senate has looked at some proposals to cut either the corporate income tax or the personal income tax. Uh, there have been efforts to, in the House and the Senate proposals to eliminate the, the city income tax, which would obviously directly impact our members. Uh, there was a house proposal to eliminate the rest of personal property tax with no replacement funding. So again, lots of lots of different ideas that are being, you know, trial balloons floating out there. And so trying to discern which ones are, you know, are, are being just kind of introduced and, and left out there and which ones actually have legs. That's what we'll be watching very closely and working to, to deflect any impact on local government. And I think the concern is just, it's the long-term impact. I mean, they may have a lot of money right now. They could say, oh, we're, we're going to absorb this through our rainy day fund, whatever they decide. But moving forward, you know, these things snowball. And so the cut made today is still in place 10 years from now, and that's income that our communities are relying on. So that's really what we're paying probably the most attention to is that long-term impact. Absolutely. Okay. Um, 
Uh, will the changes to revenue sharing distributions be made retroactive to when the census numbers would have normally been implemented? Yes, that is the thing that, again, if you are a, if you're a community that grew, you're expecting uh, an increase and you should have been expecting that increase going back all the way to October of 2020. If you're a community that declined in population, you would be seeing a reduction in your payments going back to October of 2020, which is where the concern is. And that's where that $50 million the governor proposed in her budget really comes into play that we have been asking for, which is we need to make sure that there's no clawback back to October of 2020 for anyone that was quote unquote overpaid since, since October. But that is state law does say back to October of 2020. Okay, and then we have another question here. Well, it's more of a comment. I'm concerned about what the census numbers do for our Act 51 money as well. Uh, and, and I can weigh in on that very directly, Matt, because Act 51 is, is different than what we see in the revenue sharing component because- Can you explain what that is, Act 51? Yeah, so Act 51 is the, the funding that each of our local entities get. So all of our cities and villages are also road agencies. And so Act 51 is the statutory requirement to distribute gas tax and registration fees out to those road agencies. So whether they be at the city village level or at the county road commission level. Um, although the difference between what we see in revenue sharing and what we see in Act 51 funding, as Chris had mentioned, for revenue sharing, there's a very specific point in time in which it triggers that um, distribution happening. That same aspect in terms of a specific date and time does not uh, or is not included in Act 51. Uh, it is basically essentially when they receive the numbers, uh, which they have. And so Act 51 and the, and is then controlled by the, the Department of Transportation. And when Treasury then sends out the, the checks, they will do that based on uh, the Department of Transportation adjusting those numbers as of December of last year. There is no clawback scenario. So if you were getting money based on the formula with population numbers, uh, you know, in November and, and October and September of last year, no clawback. Also, it's very different in the sense that where revenue sharing is purely based on per capita from a constitutional standpoint, Act 51, the primary driver of your revenue source is actually your lane miles uh, and whether it's a primary or a local road. So the population impact uh, and the changes in those populations wouldn't be nearly as drastic, but those are now in place and they will be seen in all checks going forward, but no clawback of any revenue in that scenario, unlike revenue sharing. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think yeah, that's I just, all the questions that we have. Go ahead, Chris. I just wanna add, obviously members, you can see from this, the census impacts a whole host of different um, funding streams that local governments have access to. And each different act, each different statute that sets those up has different criteria on when those numbers come into play. So, you know, like I said, the Revenue Sharing Act, you have a date you are eligible for as of October of 2020, and it's subject to adjustments that are made by the state demographer according to statute. As John mentioned, Act 51, that road funding formula, has a different timeline, different population factors that come into play. So like I said, uh, every every different act where you have the census or your population impacting your uh, your distribution will have a different criteria. So just know that what you're hearing here may not be the same as a different a different revenue that you're expecting or a different grant you're dealing with. And just spe speaking of grants, I think one thing I'll, I'll circle back to: we spent a lot of time talking today about the upcoming budget that starts October first of twenty three. There is some money on the table today and some deadlines going on today uh, that members should be aware of that both Jen and Harrisana have been tracking. I know Harrisana from the, uh, the public safety standpoint, there are some dollars out there members can apply for. And Jen, I know you've been working with MEDC on some funding they've got available. And I think there's separate, John, some separate announcements that may be taking place today um, with regard to what uh, some funding Mishta is making available and then uh, water, uh, water rearage money. So there's a lot of different money flowing out there today. Do we wanna spend a minute or two just updating our members on those timelines uh, and, and just making sure that folks are aware of money that's available for them or their utilities today? 
Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And I just want to preface that with the fact that we do have our Serve My City program that can help you kind of sort out a lot of these different grants. You just reach out to you know anyone on this call. We get you in touch by, I believe the email is servemycity at mml.org. Uh, serve is, and then MI is the mis- initial there in the middle. So they, we can help you with that. So if, you, if you're just trying to, if you don't have the staff to keep track of all these things, you know, give us a call and we can help you. And, and it's a free service that we're doing. So we have that available to you. So go ahead team and talk about some of the, the pressing ones that are coming up. I'll jump in and talk about the first responder training and recruitment grants, which actually um, have their due date of tomorrow, February 15th, 2022. So these grants are being administered through the Department of Treasury and they are available to local units who have police and fire departments. They are able to apply for 100,000 in training and a separate 100,000 in recruitment. Uh, So this is really important, a clarification point from earlier uh, during the application process. We have posted all the details to this, the application, also the FAQ that's been provided by Treasury on our Inside 208 blog. So folks can go there and check out all the information. And like Matt mentioned, let us know if you have any questions about getting help um, and working to get these grants. Because again, this is a really, really easy one that's on the table and they are actively looking for communities to apply. I believe the overall amount was 5 million. Uh, so with that and the benchmarks, there's a lot to go around. So definitely jump on that one if you haven't already. So that 100000 in recruitment, does that mean like signing bonuses or what can you use that money for? So one thing I will preface that was shared by Treasury is that the awards are only for one year. So be conscious if payroll is something that you would like to utilize these funds are because, because you know, we want to make sure that ultimately we're recruiting people and that they stay. And so... Ideally, a lot of it's around programming and marketing and resources and kind of things like that. But if, you know, hiring someone specifically is something that you need, discuss that in your application and share, you know, what that person's going to do or what that hire will do for the community and help with, you know, process and services and everything. But just be cognizant that you're going to have to define that in a way that shows that if you do not have the money in the future, how would you then retain that employee? So just something to think about. Great. Thank you. I think you were um, commenting on the revitalization and placemaking grant money that we had Michelle Wildman on a week or two ago talking about um, about that. So they're anticipating the MEDC will release the application and open that application period sometime in March um, next month. And then I believe the awards will be given out sometime in the summer, um, or at least that's the the uh, approximate timeline. Uh, there is the web page I can drop in in the chat here that's got uh, some questions, Q&A. Folks could uh, submit questions. There's a recorded webinar um, that the MEDC has held about the funding. But I think the point for our members to take away is they're not looking for single projects to fund with that necessarily. They're looking for uh, regional ask. So coming in, uh, or at least more competitive, it sounds like your application will be if it's part of a larger ask in your region. Um, and so I'll, I'll drop that in the chat and then people can also go back and watch our last live with the league that Michelle Wildman from the MEDC was on talking about this program. Great, thank you. And Harrisana did put a link to her blog for the first responder training grant that's due tomorrow. Someone asked for that. So that link is in the chat as well. And, and Matt, I'll hop in and talk a little bit about some money available for for water, essentially uh, back payment on, on water and wastewater bills. Um, it is a program that's actually a result of some federal funding that we received into the state. Uh, it's known as the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program, or LIWAP uh, for short. Um, I just put a uh, link into the chat uh, to the state's webpage on that. This is a little different in the sense that it is it is a process that has to run through your local or a local community action agency rather than the local unit of government going direct toward to a department or a, a fund source in which to do that. But it can be extremely helpful in the sense that if you have customers, which most of our communities, if not all of our communities do, that may be behind on their bills, a way to get direct assistance uh, if they qualify based on a particular set of circumstances uh, outlined by the federal government. 
Um, I think it's an important program to take advantage of uh, if, you, if you have the ability and the capacity to work with your community action agency to do that. It's also a program that, that we have advocated for to try to be sustainable long term. And so members taking advantage of that is a good sign to the legislature that it is a program that has uh, legs, as I will say, and, and ultimately could be taken advantage of, um, you know, beyond just kind of the current federal funding that's available to us today. And one more, Matt, that actually was announced today by the governor in the current budget. Uh, there's $242 million in a homeowner assistance fund that MISHTA, the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, is, uh, is coordinating. And those funds, I'll uh, put a, a link in the, in the chat there for everyone, uh, that program, the Michigan Homeowner Assistance Fund, uh, those dollars are available even for things like um, uh, overdue property taxes. Uh, delinquent property taxes for residents. So members, you know, if you're looking in your community at residents with, with certain needs, uh, know that there is a not only money, again, for, for local communities like Harrison has talked about or for our utilities like John talked about, but also for, uh, for residents themselves. And again, all of that kind of impacting, uh, impacting the revenues available to the local government. So definitely take advantage of those, investigate those uh, in your community. And if you have any questions, Certainly the Serve My City program or folks with any of the state agencies, any of these programs can be helpful. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that's everything. I do want to remind uh, the viewers here today to, to, to register for CapCon. If you haven't done so, please do so. It's going to be a great event. It's a day and a half, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, March 15th, 16th. Uh, you may hear, we heard from Brave Range also some of the things they're going to be talking about. We have uh, general sessions on with our Lansing team talking about the latest at Lansing. We have sessions uh, from our state agency leaders about uh, talking about the different programs they're working on that I think would be very beneficial to our members. So we have a lot of great breakouts as well. So I really encourage our members to sign up for our CapCon. Um, we're really looking forward to it. It'll be our first one in person since 2000. 19 so it's been a while uh so we really are looking forward to seeing everybody and hope they can uh make it um our next uh, live with the league will be uh, march 7th we're going to skip next week uh, president's day because a lot of our communities are closed on next monday so we will be back uh live on march 7th as all goes as planned so again thank you team uh until next time we will see you on uh, live with the league